welcome back to the synthesis of yoga the book that changed my life this is our episode number 38 book the yoga of divine works first chapter 21st paragraph and this chapter is dealing with the four instruments the four aids the shastra the science utsaha the effort guru the teacher time kala the time that is required in the last episode we were covering the aspect of the teacher the guru and the supreme teacher of integral yoga is the inner guide who is veiled in the beginning we do not recognize and as we progressively unfold the journey we begin to recognize and gradually identify with that in our wisdom in our will in our love and joy so let's now move on to this episode you can see the link to this chapter in the description so those who are not familiar please look at that chapter paragraph number 21 we will be going line by line to see no become and fulfill this one in our inner inner selves and in all our outer nature was always the secret goal and becomes now the conscious purpose of our embodied existence to see to know become to see know become first is seeing it then knowing it in depth and then becoming and fulfill this one in our inner selves it's a plural selves inside there are multiple selves multiple parts of our being there is a mental self the vital self physical self physical being vital being mental being and all of them need to become this one and in all our outer nature our outer part of the being the outer part of the mind outer part of the vital outer part of the physical all of them must reveal the one and which had been always the goal of our whole nature's yoga has this as the goal to bring out the veiled divinity and reveal it in the manifest world that had been the secret goal now it has become a conscious purpose becomes now the conscious purpose of our embodied existence we have this material existence which is embodied we have a material body and the purpose of this embodied existence is to bring out and reveal this hidden self the divine self the one in all that will find its radiant expression through these molds which are currently obscure and limited and narrow and not able to express that divine light and delight so to see know become and fulfill this one in our inner selves and in all our outer nature was always the secret goal and becomes now the conscious purpose of our embodied existence to be conscious of him in all parts of our being and equally in all that the dividing mind sees as outside our being is the consummation of the individual consciousness so at two levels we become conscious of him that inner guide in all parts of our being that is within ourselves we are made of multiple parts and all parts we will recognize the divine 
guide, shaping, molding. Not only that, outside us, everything outside us, we have an inside and outside. Ego creates this boundary. Therefore, we experience everyone else as not me. It is somebody out there, often perceived as a danger out there. And in the process of yoga, it's not just inside we recognize the divine presence, molding and shaping, and we become one with that. Outside as well, what appears to be divided and separate, we need to see that as the one single being. So, equally in all that, the dividing mind sees as outside our being. The very nature of the mind is to divide, to dissect, to separate, so that it identifies various patterns, categorizes, organizes. It's a movement of putting pieces together. It's a divided mind. As the dividing mind sees as outside our being, it's the consummation of the individual consciousness. It is the ultimate result, ultimate journey, the destination, the consummation of our individual consciousness. To be possessed by him, to be possessed by him and possess him in ourselves and in all things is the term of all empire and mastery. To be possessed by him, possessed by the divine consciousness. To be possessed by him and possess him in Ourselves and in all things is the term of all empire and mastery. Becoming the master of that empire. First is the inner empire, then the outer empire. So, to be possessed by him and possess him in ourselves and in all things. To possess the divine in all things is the term of all empire and mastery. To enjoy him in all experience of passivity and activity, of peace and of power, of unity and of difference is the happiness which the jiva, the individual soul manifested in the world is obscurely seeking. This is the seeking of the jiva. Jiva is the individual soul manifested in the world who is searching in unity and difference, in peace and power, in passivity and activity, in whatever be this range, in the entire spectrum, we must be able to enjoy him in all experience, which otherwise is obscurely seeking. So, to enjoy him in all experience of passivity and activity, we can enjoy the divine in passivity. How does that happen? And often this happens when we are in a deep meditation and we dive deep and come in touch with the self-existent joy. But that is a passive enjoyment of the divine existence. A causeless joy, Atma Prasada, that gladness of our being, pure peace and joy, self-existent. But that is a passive enjoyment. We need active enjoyment where we are pouring into the world as action, which is a pouring out of the ananda of our eternal self in its becoming in time. So, to enjoy him in all experience of passivity and activity, of peace and of power. Our challenge is when it comes to power and action in the world, that is where the obscurities of the world also shows up, entanglements of the world also shows up. It's very easy to be in the space of knowledge and love, but to touch the dimension of power and to experience the ananda of creation, this is the most challenging part. Peace is relatively easy. Passive peace. A dynamic peace that pours into action and embraces the world, very challenging. But that too is part of our realization of unity and of difference. 
And it's very easy to enjoy when people are of similar views and viewpoints and visions and coming together, shared love and shared bonding. But when it comes to people who are of a different perspective, different sense of reality, and how do we bond and connect and unite with that which is very, very different from what we are? So, to enjoy him in all experience of passivity and activity, of peace and of power, of unity and of difference, is the happiness which the jiva, the individual soul manifested in the world, is obscurely seeking. We are seeking that in the entire spectrum. This is the entire definition of the aim of integral yoga. It is the rendering in personal experience of the truth which the universal nature has hidden in herself, which she travails to discover. So this is the entire definition of the aim of integral yoga. There is something that is hidden. There is a treasure of the honeycomb of delight hidden in the very depths of our being, in the depths of nature. Discovering that and bringing that out in the full spectrum of our active and dynamic side of our being, in the outer and the inner, the entire integral realization is this one. So this is the entire definition of the aim of integral yoga. It is the rendering in personal experience. Rendering in personal experience. We are isolated small individuals who are opening to the universal and transcendent. So in our personal experience, rendering in personal experience of the truth which universal nature has hidden in herself and which she travails to discover. That discovery happens in us. It is the conversion of the human soul into the divine soul and of natural life into divine living. So this is the consummation. It is the conversion of the human soul into the divine soul and of the natural life into divine living. The surest way towards this integral fulfillment is to find the master of the secret who dwells within us. Open ourselves constantly to the divine power, which is also the divine wisdom and love, and trust it to trust to it to effect the conversion. So he's reiterating that point. And Sri Aurobindo, in multiple ways, repeat the same point, and which we may consider. It is a kind of why he is repeating, but the very fact of listening to the same thing from multiple perspectives, it leaves the imprint, it molds the mind, it shapes the window of our cognition and open ourselves to that possibility. So the surest way towards this integral fulfillment, is referring to integral fulfillment, is to find the master of the secret, who dwells within us, open ourselves constantly to the divine power, which is also the divine wisdom and love. Power, wisdom and love, the triple aspects. Love, knowledge, power, these are the three different facets of the Satchidananda. And trust to it to effect the conversion. But it is difficult for the egoistic consciousness to do this at all at the beginning. So it's a difficult thing to do. While it's very easy to understand the concept, we can find people who are very clear about this as a concept. But when it comes to practice, what it actually implies, this is where the whole challenge is. Not in understanding the concept. But it is difficult for the egoistic consciousness to do it at all at the beginning. And if done at all, it is still difficult to do it perfectly and in every strand of our nature. Occasionally doing it is still doable. 
but doing it perfectly and consistently and in all strands of our being. This is what takes time. One of our part may open up first. The mind may learn to discern and open a little bit. Then the heart may open up. Then the energy might open up. So it takes time to bring in every layer of our being and open to this possibility. So if done at all, it is still difficult to do it perfectly and in every strand of our nature. It is difficult at first because our egoistic habits of thought, of sensation, of feeling block up the avenues by which we can arrive at the perception that is needed. It is an existing habit of our egoistic consciousness which has its corresponding thought, sensation, feeling. When feelings are habitual automated, Sensations are also largely operating on that automation. So are the thoughts. So all that limits the possibility of our perception. So it is difficult at first because of because our egoistic habits of thought, of sensation, of feeling block up the avenues by which we can arrive at the perception that is needed. It is difficult afterwards because the faith, the surrender, the courage requisite in this path are not easy to the ego-clouded soul. While soul is pure and has its true knowledge, it gets clouded with ego and that makes it impossible or rather difficult for faith, surrender and courage to really show up because of the ego clouding that takes place. And it is only when we start walking the path, the difficulties of the path, particularly our lower nature, which we had been obeying all this time. And once we realize that we need to drop many of the old habits and walk into a new possibility, when that walk begins to happen, that is when you encounter the internal resistance and revolts and all kinds of difficulties. And this is where you need faith, you need courage and surrendering to the divine light and force. So that's why it is difficult afterwards. Once you start walking the path, once the difficulties shows up, so, it is difficult afterwards because the faith, the surrender, the courage requisites on this path are not easy to the ego-clouded soul. We get easily distracted and diverted by the narratives of the ego which cannot perceive the divine action in the world. It is obsessed with itself. And the bad things happening to me and me, the little suffering victim and you lose the contact with the soul, the inmost being and you're clouded and lost. So and it happens very, very common and one must have the faith, surrender and courage. The divine working is not the working which the egoistic mind desires or approves for it uses error in order to arrive at truth suffering in order to arrive at bliss, imperfection in order to arrive at perfection. This is a typical pattern of the ego-bound consciousness. It needs error in order to know truth. It needs suffering in order to know bliss. It needs imperfection to know perfection. This is the very nature of the ego-bound consciousness. And it desires that duality. It looks for this duality and its very nature is to see the imperfection and contrast it with perfection. See the suffering and contrast it with happiness and bliss. And see the falsehood, the error and contrast it with truth. So it gets bound into that dual perception and wherever there is this duality conflict 
and rejection is bound to be there. How do you arrive at the perception of the one in all when you are bound by duality? And that is the challenge of the ego-bound consciousness. So the divine working is not the working which the egoistic mind desires or approves. It doesn't desire that perception and that working because the mind is obsessed with the duality and it won't approve of that one consciousness operating behind everything and even when it is molding and when it is difficult challenges you're dealing with the difficult people and situations the ego bound consciousness is bound to stick to its perception of duality and go on fighting with the reality and that makes it really difficult for the divine working to enter into us so the divine working is not the working which the egoistic mind desires or approves for it uses error in order to arrive at a truth suffering in order to arrive at, a, at bliss imperfection in order to arrive at perfection the ego cannot see where it is being led. It revolts against the leading, loses confidence, loses courage. So the divine wisdom is guiding, nudging, pushing, leading. And yet the ego cannot see where it is being led. First of all, it is bound by its own limited perception. And it is not yet able to discern the divine wisdom. And it is tied to its duality of perceptions. And therefore, what happens? It revolts against the leading. And it loses confidence when a challenge shows up on the path. It loses confidence. It loses courage when there is all the what so-called support that ego was clinging to. When these things are removed, it loses courage. So it revolts, it loses confidence, and loses courage. This is a common problem of the ego-bound consciousness. These failings would not matter, for the divine guide within us is not offended by our revolt, not discouraged by our want of faith, or repelled by our weakness. He has the entire love of the mother and the entire patience of the teacher. Patience of a teacher and love of a mother. These two are there. And we, when we look at the divine, when the ego looks at the divine, we tend to interpret the divine in terms of human terms. So therefore, we will come up with the explanation, no, divine will not like it, divine will be angry with me. And all these human templates getting applied to the divine. That's one of the common error that we do. So our failings really do not matter because the divine is all wise, all seeing and has the patience of a teacher and love of a mother. Therefore, the divine guide within is not offended by our revolt. We can revolt, we can fight. But the divine won't be offended because the divine consciousness is not an ego-bound consciousness. It is not a tiny little human-like personality which would feel offended if we revolt, if we fall, if we fail. That is what normally happens with our regular life. Starting with our school, if you get good marks, parents are happy. If you don't get good marks, there is all kinds of unhappiness. Same thing with the work everywhere you no know, success everyone appreciates and when you fail then you're criticized and harassed and this is how the human world is and we expect the divine to be of the same nature but that's not how the divine wisdom works divine wisdom doesn't get offended by our revolts or upset by our failures there is the love of a mother and infinite patience of a teacher so these failings would not matter, for the divine guide within is not offended by our revolt, not discouraged by our want of faith, or repelled by our weakness. 
He has the entire love of the mother and the entire patience of the teacher. But by withdrawing our assent from the guidance, we lose the consciousness through, though not all the actuality, not in any case the eventuality of its benefit. There is one thing that we can do is withdrawing our assent from the guidance. Guidance is coming, but I will not listen to it. Even in that condition, we lose the contact, but in, even then, we don't lose entirely its benefit. There is, divine will still find ways to reach out and mold us, nudge us, and push us on the path. But by withdrawing our ascent from the guidance, we lose the consciousness, though not all the actuality. To a certain extent, we lose, but not all the actuality. Not in any case, the eventuality of the benefit. Eventually, we will arrive at. That is inevitable. We can delay, we can stretch, we can go slow. But result eventually must happen. It will happen because the divine has chosen us. And we can revolt, we can fight, we can delay. But the long-term result is inevitable. It must come. As in the world, so in ourselves, we cannot see God because of his workings. And especially because he works in us through our nature and not by a succession of arbitrary miracles. This is another demand of the small ego-bound human consciousness. Show me miracles, then I will trust you. And that's the reason many of the teachers who resort to showing miracles in order to gain confidence of the people. Divine really doesn't work through miracles. Divine respects your evolutionary current status and works through it through the laws of nature that is already established. There is no arbitrary violation of the rules of physics, chemistry, biology, none. It will follow, but it will find its shortest path and miraculous results, but always honoring what is already being established and pushing the boundaries beyond the normal. As in the world, so in ourselves, we cannot see God because of his workings. And especially because he works in us through our nature and not by a succession of arbitrary miracles. A succession of arbitrary miracles. We want us to be saved in one go, but it doesn't happen that way. No miracles, no succession of miracles. It obeys, it respects, because it works through our nature. Man demands miracles that he may have faith. He wishes to be dazzled in order that he may see. <laughs> this is the typical need and demand of the normal human nature. Therefore, you can see many of the spiritual schools where disciples will start collecting the miracles created by their teachers. Unless miracles are told, you will not trust that this person is in touch with something that is sublime and divine. It needs some gross outer form of miraculous activity. So one way or other people would either imagine miracles or find something or other that legends are built. And so man demands miracles that he may have faith. In order to have faith in the divine wisdom and working, we want to see miracles. Heal my illnesses overnight, then I shall have faith. Give me my desires granted, then I shall have faith. All this kind of stuff that we come up with. It's a crude human nature. So the man demands miracles that he may have faith. He wishes to be dazzled in order that he may see the God's workings in the world. We cannot see the God's working in the world because 
the divine respects the laws of nature. And we look for someone who can walk over the water, fly in the sky, then yes, there is something divine happening. So people go on bringing out the ashes and uh, Rudraksha and all kinds of things in order to dazzle the people. And this is one of the challenges and temptations to which many people fall into. And this impatience, this ignorance may turn into a great danger and disaster if in our revolt against the divine leading, we call in another distorting force, more satisfying to our impulses and desires, and ask it to guide us and give it the divine name. This is the danger. Because man seeks miracles, there are beings that are not necessarily the divine being, intermediate range of beings, because we exist as an isolated, tiny little ego personality. But beyond this ego personality, in the universal nature, there are many levels of being and corresponding powers. And they would love to have an instrument, a human being, surrender to them. In order to get that surrender, in order to get your buy-in, it would also manifest and express through people the cheap tricks of spirituality through the dramatic materializations, dematerializations, miracles, and all kinds of stuff. In that process, what happens is this intermediate range of beings who takes possession of an individual who may end up playing the role of a guru or a teacher in the name of the divine, I am the God, and I am here to guide you, to lead you, and harness thousands of disciples and mislead them. And this happens. And this is a kind of vicious cycle, the mutually supporting these two, the demand of the average man for the miracles and the man who is on the path of yoga, getting possessed by the beings of the intermediate zone, who would be granting these bones of demonstration of the siddhis in order to satisfy the human ego. And this is a huge danger. And this is where eventually you invoke a darker force that simply takes possession of the masses. So, And this impatience, this ignorance, may turn into a great danger and disaster if in our revolt against the divine leading, we call in another distorting force. Because it is a distorting force which resort to drama more easily satisfying to our impulses and desires because we need the drama to be satisfied and our desires to be fulfilled through that and ask it to guide us and give it the divine name. This is a huge mistake, a huge danger and pretty common, much wider than what we would acknowledge. True great masters will not be resorting to such drama. And whenever you see the devotees and the followers hankering for miracles and collating the miracles and glorifying the miracles, note there is a danger there. Beware of that danger. So, and this impatience, this ignorance may turn into a great danger and disaster if in our revolt against the divine leading, we call in another distorting force, more satisfying to our impulses and desires and ask it to guide us and give it the divine name. So let's be conscious of all these potential dangers on the way so that we don't fall into these traps. And... Uh, Always remember that divine guidance, there is a certain subtlety to it without resorting to drama. It obeys, it respects the nature as it is and not resorting to succession of miracles, no arbitrary workings, it respects things as it is. Not looking for a way to impress you through drama. So, keeping that in mind, let's remember that 
inner guide is the key to integral yoga, especially for integral perfection. And that guide would respect your nature and nature of the society and works quietly, subtly through it to make the transformation possible. So with that, we end this episode. Thank you for being with me in this journey. Please do subscribe to this channel so that you get the notification. And also, I'm looking forward to hear your feedback, your suggestions. Thank you. See you next week.